To Save a Hobbit by Random Plot Bunny. Chapter 6. Soren strode from the rune as Oin began looking over the hobbit. His arms still tingled from where it had been holding the small man close, and he worked hard at ignoring the stares that his company gave him as he walked out of the hall. He'd expected those stares from members of the company that had become close to the small man, but ever since waking up from the drug stupor Oin had insisted would help him heal, he had been getting those looks from everyone. It was as if they were all disappointed with him, with his attitude towards their burglar, and he knew they were right to be. He had been disappointed in his own behavior even before the cliff battle. Just thinking of it made those fresh horrors rise again into his mind's eye. The orc blade so close he could smell its foul stench, and then Bilbo had leaping to his rescue, slashing into the creature and saving his life, finding out just how badly the small man had been injured before his rescue of Thorin, as well as during it, had made the royal dwarf feel humbled that such loyalty could be directed towards him even after everything had done to, and more importantly not done for, the small man. And that short speech Bilbo gave, just before the goblins had taken them, and just after Thorin had said such harsh things, had been a wake-up call that there was more to the hobbit than first met the eye. And then that fall, he could still hear the shrill cry of his name in the air and see the panicked look in those soft eyes as he'd gone over the edge, murderous goblin still clutched in his arms. No one had ever sacrificed themselves for him before, and Blue had been given less of a reason to do so than the others had. What's more is that he couldn't name the warmth that spread through his chest when they were out of those Mahalversaken caves, and he knew that the hobbit had survived. Thorin looked up at the clear sky and towards where he knew his mountain lay, trying to clear his mind of all distracting thoughts. He didn't know what these new feelings toward the small man were or why they made him want to be close to him all the time to want to hold Bilbo in his sleep and ensure that he was kept safe. But once he had his mountain back, he could take the time to figure it out. There was still too far to go in their journey to be sidetracked by feelings, no matter how warm they made one feel. But maybe he could at least take the time to apologize. Bulfur watched with a grin as his cousin and the young ones swarmed Bilbo with food and dock. He was glad Biffer was coming out of his shell now that he had made a friend that didn't judge him. But he was sad knowing that that friend wouldn't survive too many more years, if even to the end of the journey. Bulfur had been shocked at Bilbo's innocent thankfulness in the cave. It was almost as if the small man hadn't known just how badly he'd been insulted. And then he'd been horrified when the hobbit had gone over the edge of that walkway while saving the life of someone who had never even said a kind word to him. Bogfer, for all his good-natured cheer, didn't think he'd have it in him to so casually dismiss such behavior himself, let alone sacrifice himself for his tormentor. He'd have been so relieved when he saw that the small man was still alive, and then Horrified anew when Bubu had been tossed around by that warg, all while saving Thorn's life again. But it wasn't until reaching the shapeshifter's hall that he'd truly known how much strength resided in that fragile looking frame. They had been denied shelter at first until the giant of a man had spotted the unconscious form of their burglar being carried by Biffer, who had refused to let anyone else carry his injured friend, and then they had all been ushered inside and given food, furs, and medicine. Gandalf had sat at the head of the table with the large man and filled in the gaps in their journey that he had glossed over in his telling earlier, while Oin had bustled around them and attended to their various injuries. It wasn't until the healer had sat down once more, after rechecking Bilbo's bandages and making Thorin take a healing drought that would force him to sleep through the worst of his pain, that their host asked the question that everyone could see had been uppermost in his mind. I now know where you are going and why, but what I most want to know is this. Why have you brought a dying hobbit so far from his homelands? Silence met his question as several eyes looked around confusedly. 
Hadn't they been told that Bilbo would be all right? And many more glared at the tabletop with varying degrees of protective anger shining in their faces. Gandalf looked about ready to speak when Balin, that silver-tongued politician, had interrupted. Master Bayon, this is a private subject that the dear lad doesn't like spoken about. Must we really give up his secrets when he is not awake to speak for himself? The large man had then studied Balin for a short time while seeming to contemplate an answer. The bunny man smells of slow death and herbs to slow it even further. Most of you smelled resigned like you already know about his dying. The rest of you simply smell confused. The large man gave a tilt to his head as he studied the dwarves before narrowing his eyes in sudden suspicion. I simply wish to know why you are dragging a suffering creature with you on a journey that makes him suffer even more. If you do not tell me, then I will simply keep him here where he will be safe and protected until his end. And I will kick the rest of you out to fend for yourselves in the hell that is now Mirkwood. With that, he went silent, waiting for an answer. Ori was the one who spoke up to answer, never taking his eyes from the table. He came with us of his own free will, and none of us knew that he was ill at first. He told me that he'd rather die on an adventure than be pitied to death while being circled by his family of vultures in the shire. Here the young scribe finally looked up at the large man, and Bofur had had to look away from the tears barely being held back in those wide eyes. Please don't separate us from him. We are the only family he has now. Do you honestly want to condemn him to dying alone? Not waiting for an answer, the scribe got up and went to sit with his unconscious friend. It was several quiet minutes later when their host finally stood from the table and addressed them again. You are all welcome to stay until your wounds are healed, and I will provide you with what supplies I can when the time comes for you to leave. Now I shall leave you for tonight, as I believe you all have much to discuss. As the large man made his way out of the hall, Quiet Bomber was the first to ask the question on the minds of all those who hadn't already known. Is he really dying? Shaking his head free of the memory, Bulfur looked back at the small group on the floor in time to see Bilbo's face scrunch up at his new nickname. It was a sight to make even the coldest of hearts melt. Speaking of which, Thorin had just re-entered the room with a fussing oin at his side. Turning his gaze back to the happier side of the laughing group on the floor, Bofur let himself remember one last thing from that night. Their promise. They had all promised to not tell Thorin unless Bilbo wanted them to. It was bad enough that they had had to violate his trust as much as they already had, as it is. He was so happy that his friend was awake and sad too, knowing that he'd been the one to tell the small man's secret to a complete stranger. He would need to apologize about that soon. It wasn't until Bayorn had walked off, he had probably realized how intimidating his large size was to the injured and tiny in comparison man, that he managed to gather the courage to speak, but then Thorin had interrupted him. Master Buggins, May I have a word? Ori was slightly taken aback by the formal tone that the royal was using. He almost sounded respectful. Of course, what can I do for you? Ori refused to move away. Whatever Thorne had to say could be said in front of everyone, or not at all, and was pleased when the others all held their ground too. Thorne looked uncomfortable for a moment. Probably his wounds painting him, Ori realized, with a small pang of sympathy towards his king and then knelt down and bowed his head, gaining the attention of the whole room. Master Baggins, I wish to apologize for all the slights I have given you, as well as my inexcusable rudeness. You have shown yourself to be a valuable companion on this journey time and again, and I sorely regret that it took almost losing you to make me realize it. I know that it will take time to gain your friendship and trust, but if I can have your forgiveness, then I will count myself lucky. Ori was absolutely stunned. He had never even read about a king begging forgiveness before, let alone from someone of a different race, and turned to see Bilbo with an equally shocked expression on his face. Master Oakenshield, the small man began, 
I would like nothing more than to call you my friend and ask for my forgiveness. You have it. Now, please, get up off the floor. You can't be doing your injuries any good kneeling like that. As Thorne stood up with a rare happy smile on his lips, he finally let Oin lead him away to change his bandages. Once the Dwarven King was well away, Ori turned back to the task at hand. Bilbo? Ori! You've gone pale! Should we call Oin back over? Shaking his head, Ori rushed through the explanation of how he had betrayed Bilbo's trust several nights before when they had first arrived. And if you can never forgive me, I will completely understand, he concluded while staring at the floor. He expected to get yelled at, or even told to leave the small man's sight. But he didn't expect to be drawn into a hug. Thin arms were strong around his neck, and Ori, hesitating about where he was to place his own hands so as not to jostle broken ribs, gratefully returned the unexpected hug. Ori, I'm just glad you all were here when I woke up. I would never be able to forgive myself if one of you got hurt because of a promise you made to me. I don't mind that you told Master Bayorn about me, nor do I mind that the others now know. Though it will make it slightly awkward when Thorin learns that he was the last to know once he finds out. I'm just glad that everyone is safe. Ori finally pulled away from the embrace and wiped a few stray tears from his eyes. When Story starts mothering you, you might just change your tune, he joked, trying to lighten the mood. I'll look forward to it, I promise. If he was able to raise such a fine dwarf as yourself, then he cannot be all that bad. It was only when Ori gave a watery smile that Bilbo gave one of his own. And a huge yawn. You should get some more sleep now. That was Keely. We will give a dinner later on. And that was Feely. Four sets of hands then helped the lightly protesting man to lay back down. He was asleep almost before they had fully covered him up with the furs. Ori smiled at the sleeping figure of his friend as he retreated to the table so as not to disturb the sleeping man. He was glad that their friendship was holding strong. The hobbit had quickly become his best friend, and he just didn't know what he would do when the day came that Bilbo wasn't around anymore. He surveyed the hall full of dwarves, all of them attempting to be quiet for the sake of the sleeping hobbit. It would be quite the sight to see, a dozen normally loud dwarves tiptoeing around, unless you knew why they were doing it. They were doing it because they cared. Bubo had snuck into their hearts and made a place for himself there. And Gandalf only had to say a few words, and he could tear them all to pieces. All he had to do was give them hope. Eyes alighting on the small figure sleeping soundly, Gandalf wondered if he could be so cruel as to give Bilbo such forlorn hope as he had to offer. Could he even bring himself to plant such a seed of madness in one so innocent? No, he couldn't. Telling Bilbo, or any of the dwarves actually, about the possibilities of Smaug's blood would do none of them any good and would only make things harder to accept once the time came. Decision made, he stood from his meditative pose and went to search out Thorin. He now had to tell the company leader that he would no longer be able to accompany them on their journey to take back the mountain. Away in Erebor, the tap, tap, tapping of the bird pulled him from his rest, and he opened a single eye to survey his domain. No changes. Sixty years asleep, and not a single change. He was so bored.